In today's programme, our team of real governors will be tackling a hypothetical yet realistic situation as it develops in a school. Today's challenging dilemma involves a school facing incidents of religious and racial intolerance. First, let's meet the panel. Jane Abramson, a community governor with 16 years' experience. Alex McNair, a parent governor for the last five years. And Eileen Moxon, with 15 years' governing expertise, including five as chair. Keeping a close eye on the proceedings and assessing the governor's performance is Paul McGann, an education officer with over 15 years of experience supporting and training governors and troubleshooting problems in schools. It's time for the panel to find out what today's challenge is. The head teacher of a multi-ethnic school is worried about the school experiencing rising levels of religious and racial tension. He has a very secular outlook for the school and is not keen on any overt displays of religious affiliation. One set of evangelical parents complains that the school is not fulfilling its duty to provide a daily collective act of worship, as its assemblies are not promoting the Christian faith. They suggest their own priest, a known Christian fundamentalist, should be allowed to deliver some assemblies at the school. The head's not keen on the idea, as he knows it may lead to friction with other parents. The head teacher, in my view, has a right to be quite sceptical. He has a large ethnic mix within the school. I think he would be extremely foolish to upset mm -hmm. what's running smoothly. My only query here is that it describes him as having a very secular outlook to the school. And I don't think a secular outlook is always the best position from which to understand the values which underpin quite a wide range of faiths. So I would be wanting to explore with the head teacher as a governor how we meet our obligations to the major religions. But I actually think the head teacher is taking a pragmatic approach here given the circumstances and the nature of the intake of the schools. So I think it'd be very difficult for him to change that. There has to be a uniform front on this. Yeah. I think it would be helpful for the head to have the backing of the governors on yes. an issue like this. Definitely. So it needs to be discussed at the governing body, um, but then to come to some consensus to back the head. A school such as this, which serves a multi-ethnic, multi-faith community, needs to have had a wide-ranging debate and established a policy on the relationship between the school and the community it serves. In this way, they can have some confidence that whenever they respond to individual demands or requests from parents, they are doing so in the context of a whole school policy rather than a knee-jerk response to individual issues. I think it would be setting a very bad precedent for one set of parents to um, be allowed to dictate for assembly what should happen because you will get other yeah. groups then and it could upset the harmonious balance of the school. I mean, there is still on the statute book the requirement to have assemblies of largely Christian um, origin, but which is obviously what these parents are quoting, but in most schools that is not practised today. And did he not feel that the school needs to fit the needs of the pupils? Yeah. So if, if the head teacher's got a large ethnic mix of pupils, yeah. he's got to take into account all the different yeah. cultures that he's got mixing. And I think getting the assemblies right it's actually quite difficult because existing legislation is not appropriate for contemporary British society. And I think that the problem with getting particularly fundamentalist in to do an assembly, that large numbers of children may not go to that assembly. Their parents may withdraw That's them right. from it yeah. and it would be very divisive. We've got to be inclusive. The governing body needs to ensure that the school has good answers to a number of fundamental questions, such as how is the school meeting its statutory requirement for a broadly Christian act of worship? Secondly, how is it ensuring that the needs of other faiths represented within the school community are adequately met? By having an answer to these questions, you can take the focus of the complaint away from the individual act of the assembly into more broader areas about the way in which the school serves the community. Several weeks later, a fight breaks out in the playground between two pupils. When questioned about the incident, 
the pupils are reluctant to give any information about what started the fight. The head, therefore, decides to suspend both pupils. The parents of one of the pupils contacts the school and complains that their child was provoked by a series of racist insults and that their child has been unfairly punished. The head is worried that this is potentially one of a rising number of racist incidents being documented at the school. What do our panel think about the school's response to the incident? I think also with the suspension, it's given the pupils concerned, especially the one that's been on the receiving end of these statements, a cooling down period to a degree. I mean, it's had the desired effect in that the child who's been the victim of these, his parents have actually started the ball rolling by actually speaking to the head teacher. I have to fundamentally disagree, Alex. Why is that? Because all of the literature indicates that if there is a victim, and we don't know whether there is a victim here, but if there is a victim, then it's very important that the perpetrator is punished and the victim is not. I think the head teacher took the decision on the basis that because neither of the pupils yes. talked, it yes. was not possible to say whether there was a victim or perpetrator, whether they were both equally guilty. But we also need to know what the actual school's policy is on actual physical fighting. I mean, I know the, the school that I am a governor at, if you are caught fighting, physically hitting some another pupil, irrespective of who's caused it, both have to be taken from the premises. If the school investigation reveals that both pupils have been fighting, then it may be appropriate to punish both pupils for that fight. However, if the school wants to make the point that physical retaliation is wrong when subject to racist name-calling and abuse, then they will need to reassure pupils that there are other avenues available to them other than physical violence. Why are the number of incidents on the increase? Is it something that the school aren't properly dealing with or is it other things, is it community issues which are mm. being brought into yes. school from yeah. outside? That in itself needs to be addressed. Where's the line mm. to say enough's enough? I mean, my view is enough's enough from one. Oh, I mean, we know statistically that there are a rising number of incidents in society, including in schools. But I, th I think you're right to identify that the playground and the school are places where they have to be stopped. I mean, the playground should be a place of tolerance mm -hmm. and perhaps an investigation into the area may show it's one group. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. one group of perpetrators. Mm -hmm. It might, not, you know, rather than random yeah. incidents and I think that that's important that we find mm. out what if anything is actually causing this. The governing body is rightly concerned about the reported rise in the number of racist incidents but it's important not to get too hung up on the figures themselves. It may even be that as a result of the school more effectively dealing with racism as it occurs more people are confident about coming forward and reporting such incidents. Governors need to recognise that they themselves have a statutory responsibility for ensuring that all racist incidents in a school are adequately reported and monitored. Perhaps more significant than just recording the incidents, however, is recording the outcome of such incidents and what impact it had on the school and what lessons were learned. This will enable the governing body to carry out a proper evaluation of the policies and practices they have to ensure that they're working towards reducing the level of racism in the school. Several weeks later, a national incident leads to an increase in racist activity in the local community. The Head's worried about further tensions spilling over into the school, as divisions between groups of pupils has become increasingly apparent. Several parents also question why the school with such a high ethnic mix of pupils has no governors from ethnic minorities. How can our hypothetical school heal its divisions? There are things that can be done day to day, like mm. group work in classes where um, children are deliberately mixed together from different, mm. different backgrounds and this kind of thing, mm. and activities where everybody mixes mm. together. There are many imaginative ways to handle multi-faith assemblies and to celebrate the different faiths, mm. um, particular festal, mm. festivals and that kind of thing. Mm. Because assemblies are places where 
issues like race and racism can be explored. There are two ways of dealing with it. One is just to carry on in school as it was, and it's a sort of refuge for children away from all the troubles yeah. outside. Or the second way is to confront it head on with assemblies and yeah. PSE, etc. Um, I think it depends to what extent the pupils in that particular school are affected yeah. by it. But maybe it might be a mix. I think it might be a bit of both. I think also the school needs to be actually looking at what their actual links are with the community. And if the links aren't very good, perhaps using these now to strengthen them That's right. with the events that have taken place. Schools can play a very big role in the healing process necessary whenever there's racial disharmony within a community. The big question the governing body needs to be answering is how are we listening to the views of the community at this particular time? How are we understanding their anxieties and their fears but also their hopes and aspirations and how are we reflecting those in the way in which we conduct our business within the school? They can also ensure that the school is not just dealing with the problems caused by racial disharmony but actively promoting the benefits and advantages of living in a culturally diverse society. It is important, if we can, to get the governing body to reflect the ethnic mix of the school. That is difficult, and one way in which we might be able to do that is through the local authority, because they keep lists of people who express um, a, an idea that they would like to become a governor. So we could try there, as and when there are any vacancies. Could I just say that I've gone through all the local authority lists every time we've had a governor vacancy, and they're conspicuously white. And the local authority could only assist us with community representatives, which are only four. The parent governor representatives come through by election, and the LEA representatives come through by nominations for political parties. I think that the, the school itself needs to be asking advice from the LEA. I think that's all we can do, really, because uh, there's only so far we can go to encourage this. Where we can't do things physically, because we can't create governorships if they don't exist, we need to be using other people as yeah. facilitators and enablers. Recruitment campaigns to change the cultural mix of governing bodies often fall flat because they target the wrong audience in the wrong way. What is critical here is that the governing body takes some time to find out from the local community why they don't see the governors as the way in which they can change and influence the school. That discussion in itself and the information that arises as a result of that will increase and improve the relationship between the school and the community and may lead to more ethnic minority governors coming forward in parent governor elections. Schools are both reflective of and influences on the communities that they serve. Consequently, if there are racial tensions and religious intolerance in the society surrounding a school, then these are likely to be reflected in the school's population. If the school is to play a significant role in influencing that population and demonstrating how a culturally diverse society can work, then it needs to be firmly rooted in its community and listening to the community's fears and anxieties. Governors, as community representatives of the school, will often be the first indicators of subtle shifts in, in the way in which the community is feeling about particular issues. And finally, if we truly believe that ignorance is part of the breeding ground for racism and religious intolerance, then what better place than schools to deal with this through high quality education?